I'm thinking there's a pretty good chance that if you've ever talked to people about a CPU before, a lot of times they'll talk about the speed of the CPU. Uh, in today's world, we talk about CPUs having speeds in gigahertz. And when we talk about gigahertz, first of all, a hertz is one time per second. So a gigahertz is a billion times per second. So if somebody says that they've got a three gigahertz CPU, that means that CPU, can, that clock button can be pressed three billion times a second, which is incredibly fast. Now, I wanna talk about something a little bit, and that is when we talk about a CPU speed, that is the maximum speed that the CPU can go. What determines how fast the CPU calculates is something is pressing that clock button and making it go. So if a CPU has a speed of three gigahertz, three billion times a second, you could press it once every second if you wanted to. Now that would be incredibly slow and a waste of good silicon, but understand that when we talk about a CPU speed, we're talking about its top speed. The other thing you want to be comfortable when it comes to CPUs is that CPUs come in makes and models. There are two companies that are the predominant CPU manufacturers in the world today. That's Intel Corporation and Advanced Micro Devices or AMD. Intel and AMD make CPUs that have the exact same code book inside so they can listen and program the exact same code. For example, we can write a copy of Microsoft Windows and I can run that on a computer with an AMD CPU or an Intel CPU. And even though they look a little different, they speak the same language. That's very, very important. So we have a make and a model and then we often mention a speed. So if we talk about a particular CPU, I'll say something like, um, I have a AMD Ryzen, and then there'll be some number associated with it. And that number defines a lot of stuff. For example, the uh, generation, they, maybe they've made a few generations of this Ryzen, but it will also define a speed. So you can have two identical CPUs, absolutely identical, that the only difference is speed. And it's important that we understand that because when we're building a system, we want to make sure that we're building a system that can take advantage of all the speed that that system can. So what actually presses that button is a system crystal and built onto every motherboard on earth is a system crystal. So they're small, so I want to see if we can see one of them here. So we got one right there, silver looking cylinder is a quartz oscillator. So this quartz oscillator oscillates at a very fixed amount of speed. And this is in essence what is acting like a metronome for the entire computer because it's not only the CPU that needs a clock. We'll see as we progress in this series, there's a lot of stuff on there that needs a clock as well. So that's one, but this is a little bit of an older one. So I've got a newer system here. And it took me a little research to find it, but it's right here. So these little quartz crystals act like the metronome and they push the system forward. Now, what's interesting is that the original IBM PC ran at a whopping 4.77 megahertz, which sounds really fast today, but over time, we began to push them and push them and make them faster and faster. And after a while, we began to discover something. And that is, a lot of times on a CPU, when we press the go button, we have to press it a bunch of times. What that boils down to is that the CPU spends an inordinate amount of its time inside of itself doing calculations. So it's hard to get a motherboard to go faster and faster and faster. Today's motherboards top out at around, and these would be high-end motherboards, are gonna to top out where all the stuff on the motherboard runs at a maximum of about, I don't know, 400 megahertz. And even that's rare. This is a very high-end motherboard and it's running at about 200 megahertz. So if we have a CPU that's running in these gigahertz, well, what the heck's going on? Well, what's happening is something that's absolutely fascinating called clock multiplying. Any CPU today will take the beat coming from the system crystal and inside of itself, double it, multiply it times 10, multiply it times 30, puts a big number on it, and it works out great because inside the CPU is where most of the calculations take place. In fact, on most of today's modern systems, any given click of the clock 
over 95% of them are just inside the CPU while the rest of the system is waiting for it. But don't worry, the CPU is so fast it keeps the rest of the system working. You can actually see this. Now these multipliers are actually built in to the CPU itself. So let's take a look and I can actually show you these multipliers. So over on this system right here, I've got a wonderful program which you should know and download. It's called CPU ID CPU Z. It's freeware, it works fantastically well, and I can't recommend it enough. So we're going to run this guy, and I want to show you something. What this program does is he queries the CPU and talks to it, understands everything that there is about it. So let's take a look at some stuff, starting up at the top. So this is actually an older CPU. It's an Intel brand. It's called a Core i5. We call this a microarchitecture, a specific design. And then there is a model number that's associated with it. So the code name, we call it, this is Skylake. These are the code names that help define what we call the microarchitecture. There'll be a lot of different processors based on this one type of architecture, the design of the internals of the system itself. The package, we'll talk about package in other episodes. The maximum amount of wattage it'll take, so this will take up to 65 watts. But what I want you to look at is right here. This is running at a base speed of 100 megahertz. So the motherboard itself runs at 100 megahertz, but the multiplier is times 33. Now today's modern processors slow down and speed up based on temperature, so that's what we're watching right here. The 8 to 36 is showing us that this can slow down to a multiplier of only 8 and up to a multiplier of 36. Clock multiplying is really what makes today's CPUs run at incredibly high speeds. Now, there are ways to change this, and we're going to save that for other episodes where we get into something called BIOS. But for the most part, all we have to do is we make sure when we're buying a motherboard, we buy a motherboard that's designed to work with a particular make and model and model number of a CPU, and we plop it in. The base motherboard speed is set at the factory by these crystals, and the multiplier is built in to the CPUs themselves, either at the factory at Intel or AMD, and we just get to enjoy the benefits of it. So I've got a question for you. What if we pushed it higher than it's rated to do? What if, for example, we could buy a motherboard that, uh, unlike the motherboard I've got on my system here where it only goes up to 100 megahertz, what if we could turn the knob up to 11, you know, push it to 110 megahertz? Or what if we could tell the CPU, hey, instead of going to a multiplier of 33, push it up even further than that. Push it up to 36 and always stay there. This is a process called overclocking. Overclocking is something that is, I'm not going to say commonly done, but it's an enthusiast type of thing. We buy special motherboards that have the ability to talk to a CPU and say, turn the knob up to 11. I personally don't overclock. Overclocking it makes systems unstable and generally not a good idea. For the exam, make sure that you're aware of what overclocking is. What you're doing is you're turning the knob up. However, for folks like us, we usually just want to keep it where it is. So if we can't push the system faster by just cranking the clock up, well, what can we do? Well, in that case, we can do things with multiple cores. Let me show you what I mean. Here's a typical pipeline that we would see in a earlier CPU because it's fancier today. What we began to see many years ago is that we would see where a single CPU would have multiple pipelines on it. So what would happen is that instead of it being able to handle just one piece of code at a time, it could handle two pieces of code at a time. The other thing we started to see was something like this. We would have super smart pipelines that could handle more than one, what we call thread, coming in at a time. What would happen is the prefetch would look for anybody who isn't busy on any given click of the clock, and if the calculation was just right, we could go ahead and hand it to whoever was boring at any given time. And it would make this look, act, bark, smell, taste as though you were running multiple pipelines at one time. This allowed us to do two things that kind of showed up at roughly the same time. Number one, we had something called hyperthreading. Hyperthreading is when you have one super smart pipeline that can handle two incoming pieces of code at the same time, which is pretty impressive. We also have the ability of running individual systems 
that have, in essence, multiple of these pipelines built into them. Now they're treated separately, we call them cores. So what would happen on today's systems, we have computers that can be running the equivalent of, geez, I don't know, 12 cores, 24 cores, which in essence makes one single piece of CPU act as though it's 24 different CPUs. Let me show you one right here. This is Windows Resource Monitor. And if we take a look at the default screen, it shows us how hard the CPU, how hard the hard drives are working, how hard the network is working, and how hard my RAM's working. So if I click over here, over to CPUs, what I can look at, I'm gonna have to scroll this a little bit so you can see it. On this particular CPU that I have in this system, it has one, two, three, four cores in there. Each one of these acts like its own independent CPU and allows the computer, if it can't run faster, at least there's a whole lot more lanes in the highway. The beautiful part about cores and hyperthreading is that you and I just go out and buy the best CPU that we can and we take advantage of the power of it. There's nothing for us to tweak or adjust when it comes to this. We just dig deep, see how thick our wallet is, and we buy the system we can with the most cores and the best hyperthreading, which is pretty common today, and we take advantage of the power of it. It's like today I got a sy system that has about 32 individual cores on it. Talk about speed, it's absolutely amazing.